Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar, the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. And once again, it's an honor to have you back with us on Living Divine Mercy. The visitation, which we celebrate today, May 31st, is one of the joyful mysteries of the rosary. But when many non-Catholics say that the rosary is not biblical, we can actually point to them and find all the mysteries in Scripture, including the visitation, which is in the first chapter of Luke, verse 40 through 56. But why is this feast so important, and what does it mean? We are Since the Hail Mary is a prayer to Mary, many Protestants assume that it's unbiblical. Not true. In fact, most of the prayer comes from the biblical account of the visitation of Mary to Elizabeth before both of them were to bear important children, John the Baptist and, of course, Jesus himself. The entire Hail Mary prayer is in the Bible and isn't the words of some pope or bishop, but actually the words of the angel Gabriel and St. Elizabeth, again, found directly in the first chapter of Luke. According to the Dewey Reims Bible, the most accurate English translation, when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary, he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. He doesn't say, O oh, favored one. So the beginning of the Hail Mary prayer, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, is nothing other than the greeting that the angel Gabriel gave to Mary in Luke 1.28. Hey, if it's good enough for the angel of God, it's good enough for us. Then, Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth in the Feast of the Visitation, and upon seeing Mary, St. Elizabeth cries out, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. This is exactly what Elizabeth said to her in Luke 1.42. So, our Hail Mary prayer is just repeating the words spoken in the Bible. And that makes Elizabeth's next line, Holy Mary, fitting, because calling her blessed means that she is calling her holy. So we have Holy Mary. Furthermore, having Jesus in her womb, Mary must have been a holy woman or God would not have chosen her for the most important mission in human history. But Mary said she needed a savior, so she had to be a sinner. Well, the church fathers clarify this by saying, of course, she needed a savior. She needed a savior to keep her sinless in the first place. If God can cleanse sin after it happens, why could he not prevent sin from happening in the first place? God needed to keep Mary perfect so that his son could enter a womb without sin. God cannot coexist with sin, so Mary had to be without sin because her very DNA runs through the very veins of Christ. And since God can't coexist with sin, as we said, it makes sense that the God-man Jesus Christ would have come through a woman who was holy and his mother. Thus, we have Holy Mary, Mother of God. But again, some non-Catholics also reject the title Mother of God. But here again, Elizabeth called Mary the Mother of God. She does this by saying, How is it that the Mother of my Lord should come to me? Here, Elizabeth is referring to the child as her Lord and God, and Mary as the Mother of her Lord and God. Saying mother of God doesn't mean Mary is older than God or that she created God. No, only God creates. The definition of a mother is not to create a person, but rather to give birth to a person. And that person that Mary gave birth to was a divine person, the second person of the Trinity who is God. Surprisingly, Jesus is not a human person. He is a divine person with a human nature in addition to his divine nature. So he is fully God and fully man. That is the hypostatic union. Jesus is one divine person with two 
natures, human and divine. And a mother, as we said, gives birth to a person, not a nature. So that is why we can call Mary the mother of God. She gave birth to a divine person who is God. So the Hail Mary prayer so far is the biblical words of Gabriel and Elizabeth. Finally, and most problematic for non-Catholics, is pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Well, many non-Catholics think such a request denies the teaching of Paul in 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, saying Jesus is the only mediator. But in the preceding four verses, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, Paul instructs Christians to pray for one another meaning it cannot interfere with Christ's mediatorship. He says, quote, I urge that prayers, supplications, petitions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone that is good and pleasing to God our Savior. Well, yes, Father, but dead people can't do this. No, the exhortation to pray for others also applies to the saints in heaven. We know this because Revelation 5.8 says the saints in heaven intercede for us by offering our prayers to God. It says the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp, and with golden bowls of full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints." And there's no better intercession than that of Jesus' own mother, the highest of the saints in heaven. Okay, so the Hail Mary prayer comes from the visitation of Mary to Elizabeth, as we just said, but there's more. The Bible says Mary went up into the hill country of Judea for three months. This is also exactly what King David did. In fact, tradition shows it was the exact same location. And like Elizabeth, David exclaimed in 2 Samuel 6, How is it that the ark of my Lord should come to me? Similar to Elizabeth saying, How is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? All the early Christians and church fathers called Mary the Ark of the New Covenant. So it's fitting that Elizabeth used the same words for Mary that David used for the Ark of the Covenant. And what made the child John the Baptist leap in the womb of Elizabeth? Yes, it was the sound of Mary's voice. And that is interesting because David danced in front of the old Ark and Scott Hahn tells us the same word for leapt in Hebrew is danced. So John the Baptist, who leapt in the womb before the presence of Mary, the new Ark of the Covenant housing God in the flesh, was the same as David dancing before the Ark of the Old Covenant that housed God in the stone tablet. The purpose of Mary's visitation was to bring Jesus to both Elizabeth and her child, John the Baptist, then to the whole world. Our faith teaches to Jesus through Mary, not to Mary instead of Jesus. Even though he was still in the womb, John the Baptist became aware of the presence of Christ through Mary. He leapt for joy. He danced as he was cleansed from original sin and filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth also responded and recognized the presence of Jesus. Thus, Mary exercised her function as mediatrix between God and man for the first time. She is not the mediator to the Father, as only Christ brings us to the Father. But Mary brings us to Jesus. That is why we call Mary co-mediatrix. And don't be scared by that title. Co in Latin is cum, meaning with, not equal to. Mary actively participated in God's will and acted with him as co-redemptrix because she gave Jesus his human nature, which redeemed mankind. She isn't the Savior, Jesus is, but she can help bring us to the Savior, and she works with the Savior for our salvation. That is what intercession is all about, and that 
is biblical. Remember, the Bible says that Mary says all generations will call her blessed, and that is what the visitation is all about. God honored Mary above all creatures, and since St. Gabriel and St. Elizabeth did just that, so should we. Now, speaking of St. Gabriel, his words to Mary were gratia plena, meaning full of grace. So let's meet Kelly Markham, who started a summer camp for high school girls called Grazia Plena to help them understand the lies of the secular culture and how they respond to it. When we first started dating, I was very much struck by how happy she was. She always was smiling. And I point blank asked her, like, why are you always so happy? She just said, well, it's because I'm Catholic. And that was very much true, that was very much honest. There was no deceit, it was straight to the point. Kelly Markham's faith might have been straight to the point, but her path to discern just how God would use it was anything but. Kelly had a passion for military strategy. She earned a master's degree in counterterrorism from the War Studies Department at King's College in London and was planning to work on a PhD when the grant that was funding it was discontinued. Kelly started panic applying, looking for a job, any job with the government. Then fiance Ryan knew better. I was so worried and he was like, Kelly, take a breath. You've never actually wanted to work for the government. You've told me that for years. And kind of to take this as, you know, God shutting a door, but very clearly opening a window. I was at mass in DC and I was praying after receiving the Eucharist. And out of nowhere, really, there was just very clear directive, start something for girls. I think I have to start a camp for girls dedicated to Mary. That this was the path that God had chosen was no surprise, given Kelly's upbringing and her undergrad years at Georgetown. I was 10 years old when I saw the ads for the partial birth abortion ban that was working its way up in the legislature. And so I asked my mom to explain it. But so from that point on, I was very much ignited by this. And so I was involved in Right to Life throughout high school and college. I'd seen what toxic feminism had done to women in the culture. and I'd seen what it had done to so many of my peers, beautiful, smart, intelligent women. It was suddenly taking this beautiful gift to bear life and it was making it a threat. And I saw how it played out on college campuses. I saw the hurt that so many women had was something that drove me tremendously. And I just wanted to help them before they got you know, into college. So we sort of, because of that, um, narrowed in on high school girls, that that was my, my target demographic. So we're trying to kind of cut through all of that noise and cut through all of those lies that these young women are being told or sold because ultimately we want them to have happiness, you know? And so uh, that, that's really, I would say, where the heart of the mission is. It's like before they set the world on fire, um, helping them come to terms and with the truth of who they are. The camp is four nights, five days. The first day the girls get there and we, you know, we just do icebreakers and then do a big bonfire. The second night day we delve into a little bit like here's what the world's messaging is for women. And when I say the world, what I mean is what kind of the secular take on women's achievements are. So the secular view of women's achievements is very much career oriented and then the next two days we talk about that and we talk about what that'll look like for them in each season of their life as high school students as college students dating married what will it look like when they move into the workplace or when they move into college where there might be more contradictory messages that they're hearing so we try to arm them with the knowledge and the vocabulary they have to combat that um, and so that they can engage with the world, but not lose sight of who they are and what their convictions are. And I think the Catholic Church has struggled um, for a long time in how to voice and communicate this message to them. And I think that miscommunication is what l leads a lot of young girls to leave the faith. Faithful women like Kelly were searching for more clarity. And they got it when St. John Paul II forcefully defined the role of women in a changing society. From the grotto at Lourdes, he proclaimed women's role as sentinels of the invisible, witnesses to values that, quote, can only be seen with the eyes of the heart. It's the dignity of mankind, the image of God that is imprinted on every human. It is women's job to safeguard that, to be sentinels. 
and it's a, just a beautiful vocation for us. He really talked about women's role in the church, in culture, and how we were meant to be guardians of the culture, right? We were meant to be the protectors of others. And he really, he really gave women a mission, right? Role models for how a Catholic woman should live are explored at the camp. There's Saint Zaley, the mother of Saint Therese de la Zoo, and Saint Anne Doctor Gianna, both of whom were successful professionals who raised families. And Saint Edith Stein, who wrote that the world needs not only what women have, but what women are. But rising above them all is the namesake of Kelly's organization. It's called the Grazia Plena Institute, Latin for full of grace. It's in recognition of the role played by Mary whose obedience to God brought Jesus into the world, but also whose insistence convinced a reluctant savior to perform his first miracle at Cana. Yet, at her directive, he begins his entire mission, which transformed the world. And I love that we have all these different images of Mary. So you have the, the more quiet, gentle mother, but you also have the fighter. There's a, that Mary is this great image of spiritual warfare. She's portrayed in art as crushing the head of the serpent because she's, she's the answer. I think if there's one quality of Mary that I would want women to gain from being involved in Grazia Plena is this ability to be a tabernacle and a vessel, allowing yourself to be a conduit of grace that kind of just like holds that grace and is able to send it forth to the rest of the world. It's really helped me I've always struggled with friendships with other girls and I don't really, it's just I've always struggled that and it's really helped me overcome that and pursue different friendships in the correct way and be more understanding to other people by just like silently showing it by loving others and just like when people look at you they know something's, something's different about you. They don't see you and then stop there. They see you and then through that they see Christ. You're all sort of on the same page of like, okay, we're in the same stage of life, we see the same issues, we're going, we're learning about this and we're spending time with God and we're bonding as a group. You're rejuvenated, like you're re-energized to like go out into the world, and but you also have such a better understanding of what you're supposed to be doing in the world. I don't know what lives these girls will lead, but what I would want them to know is, um, is that they're strong and that they can hold on to that strength and for them to persevere to the end because what's coming is so beautiful. Whatever challenges they face, they'll always have recourse to the faith, to Mary as their mother. Kelly often stays in touch with the girls after they have left camp and she supplements it by holding smaller gatherings or soirees throughout the year with girls and their mothers discussing similar topics. Every time when she goes and every time when she comes back, she is excited, she's fired up, and she's ready to keep going. It's fantastic to see someone that you love so enthralled in the work they do. As for why this happens, Kelly has a very Mary-like response. God asked me to do it, so I said okay. Now let's hear in scripture as Mary says all generations will call her blessed. This is Deacon Jason Lewis. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him, from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his posterity forever. Mary's prayerful heart 
is revealed in her canticle of praise, the Magnificat. In verses 46 through 49, she praises God for all that he has done for her and gives all glory to him for raising up his lowly handmaid to be the vessel of salvation for the world. Then in verse 50 through 55, she praises him for his mercy in the Hebrew that is hesed in keeping his promises to Israel, especially to the faithful poor of Israel, to send them their Messiah and Savior. It is the humble and meek who are said to be the chief objects and instruments of God's mercy. Those who are rich and powerful in the eyes of the world and those who are filled with pride at the thought of their own virtues and merits will not be open to what the Lord is doing through the poor and humble disciples. The rich will be sent empty away, while those of low degree will be exalted. Therefore, if we want to be open to the divine graces offered only to the humble and meek, we need to strip away from ourselves all self-exaltation and draw near instead to the heart of God's lowly handmaid. Now let's meet Marian brother John Luth as he tells us about his vocation story and how he's able to bring his talents to the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. In all honesty, I didn't know what religious life was. I had uh, been having difficulty uh, finding a seminary that would accept someone with um, my maturity. Uh, I had just received a very painful letter, another rejection, and on the same day, I received an invitation to attend the first ever Divine Mercy for Nurses conference. In those days, it was Divine Mercy for Nurses. And I had been attending a cynical every Monday night, and I had learned about the, uh, the, the Divine Mercy Chaplet. We closed the cynical every night, every week with that, and I soon found it immensely uh, beautiful, and I loved it. And I said, well, I love the chaplet. I'll probably love this. I didn't even know that there was a connection, only that... It had the Divine Mercy title in it, and I said, well, I like the chaplet. I'll probably enjoy this conference. So I attended. Uh, two things, or well, more than that, but the two things that struck me most uh, beautifully were the fact that the speakers were so deeply engaged in what they were saying. And the second was the dynamo, the dynamism of two of its main speakers, Father Seraphim and Father uh, Kazimierz Faulik, um, who did kind of like a team teaching. They leapt to the podium in the midst, in the middle of whatever the other one was saying. And it was so beautifully coordinated, though it was spontaneous and uh, uh, on the spur of the moment. And again, it added to the beauty, it added to the sincerity, it added to the excitement. But again, that awe-inspiring thrill of hearing truth. And all of that day, uh, I was just overpowered by all of that. And I couldn't get my mind off it for another week. For the whole rest of the week, I went through the next week. And in those days, they gave us great big packets of freebies. And I said, oh, I wonder if they have priests. So I pulled out what happened to be the Marian Helper magazine, and there on the very last page in big print was Meet Our Vocation Director, and it was Father Don Calloway. And uh, so I wrote to him, and the rest is history, really. I want to be completely transformed into your mercy 
and to be your living reflection, O Lord, may the greatest of all divine attributes, that of your unfathomable mercy, pass through my heart and soul to my neighbor. O Jesus, make my heart sensitive to all the sufferings of my neighbor, whether of body or of soul. O my Jesus, I know that you act toward us as we act toward our neighbor. I am giving you three ways of exercising mercy toward your neighbor. The first, by deed. The second, by word. The third, by prayer. In these three degrees is contained the fullness of mercy, and it is an unquestionable proof of love for me. My daughter, in this meditation, Consider the love of neighbor. Is your love for your neighbor guided by my love? Do you pray for your enemies? Do you wish well those who have, in one way or another, caused you sorrow or offended you? Well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us for this episode about Mary being the mother of God. Now, we Marian fathers here at the National Shrine make these beautiful canvases. As you can see, this one of Mary, the mother of God, and we have many others of divine mercy and the saints. So if you'd like to get one of these, the information is on your screen to help share with loved ones and to help evangelize. And our proceeds for donations go right back into the ministry of sharing God's divine mercy. So please be with us next week as we talk about scientific proof of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, Eucharistic miracles. Until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.